This episode is brought to you by my supporters on Patreon. Learn how you can keep this channel going by visiting patreon.com slash clockworkshow. Let's start off by lighting a match. Years and years ago, I was sitting on a porch in Pennsylvania lighting a match just like this, when a friend, watching it catch fire, asked me, Hey, how does all that light get in there? And yeah, I get it, that's a real galaxy brain question right there, and I laughed it off at the time. But the more and more I studied, the deeper I got into biochemistry, the more I realized that's actually a really poignant way of looking at it. Because what is the wood in this match made of, like really? Today, I'm going to finish the story of photosynthesis by showing you the machine plants use to turn air into food. We're going to talk about the Calvin Cycle, the molecular process that built civilization. Like I was saying, this is part four of four of my series on the biochemistry that powers photosynthesis. Subscribe for more chapters or go to the rest of the series before we get to the thrilling conclusion here. Now, I'm not gonna lie to you, we had to get through some really jargony chemistry to make it here, and we're going to have to dig deep into even more to finish this story. But give me a chance here, and I swear to you, the way this all comes together in the end is super worth it. Tough it out, and the chemistry will reward you. So yeah, to review, basically all the energy and calories in the world that actually matter to us come from the sun. That energy is captured by plants and cyanobacteria. In the last three videos, I've taken you through the complete story of how that energy is initially stolen from sunlight, the light reactions of photosynthesis. But that's the thing, right? The theme of this video is that energy is kinda useless unless it can be stored. So while the light reactions of photosynthesis pull off this incredible magic trick of capturing energy, we need to be able to use that energy even when the sun is down. This one bit alone is going to have far-reaching consequences. So one understated thing I love here is how the Earth's rotation is one of the best evolutionary pressures life has ever had to deal with, because it forced our most ancient ancestors to figure out a way to store the energy they were taking in from sunlight. And that's the other thing I really need to drive home. What I am going to describe to you was built out of an evolutionary process. The living things that developed photosynthesis 3.8-ish billion years ago didn't really, like, plan out the design here. They figured out how to capture whatever energy that was around them, and they had to store it using whatever was lying around at the time. And what the ancient Earth had a whole bunch of was carbon dioxide. We talk about CO2 kind of a lot these days. And when we aren't shoving billions of tons of it into the atmosphere, it's actually an extremely important part of the gaseous composition of Earth itself. And it's all because of this central carbon right here. Carbon is the star of the show today. Carbon is insane, y'all. It is a wildly versatile atom. So versatile that there are a whole bunch of textbooks and an entire nightmarish branch of science devoted to it. We don't have all day here, so let me really boil this down. Carbon rules because it's super good at sharing electrons. More importantly, carbon also has four free electrons in its outer shell. Which means it has four slots in which other atoms can bond to it. These two properties allow carbon to make a brain-melting variety of different molecules. You've got long chains, unfathomable 3D spheres, literal tubes, and hexagons. So many gosh dang hexagons. One such hexagon takes carbon and combines it with oxygen to make this shape, glucose. This is the fundamental energy storage chemical for all life on Earth. The central miracle of this video will be watching plants use the energy of sunlight to transform air itself into this sugar crystal. And oh wow, uh, we're this far into the video and we haven't even started yet. Buckle up nerds, we're about to go full biochem. We're here at the end of the light reactions of photosynthesis. Remember, we're inside a plant cell, specifically the chloroplast of those plant cells. Our last three videos have all taken place in the membrane of these structures called thylakoids. Our little thylakoids are just churning out ATP and NADPH. Finally, after three videos, we're leaving this tiny little membrane and entering the stroma, the fluid that surrounds our thylakoids in the chloroplast. At the same time our thylakoids are absorbing sunlight, the machines in the stroma are hard at work capturing CO2. Which brings us to our first and most important enzyme, Rubisco. That's not its real name, that is a wild abbreviation for ribulose biphosphate carboxylase slash oxygenase. Um, so we're just gonna go with Rubisco though, because I'm never saying that word ever again. 
Probably. Rubisco is where the Calvin cycle starts and ends. Get ready for the jargon, y'all. So our first step is to zoom in on the active side of Rubisco, the real business end here around this magnesium atom, and bring in our precursor, Ribulose 1,5-biphosphate. And look, I could be mean and just beat this video to death with the OCHEM names, but I'm gonna try really hard to simplify and guide you through what's most important here. And so, the main thing to focus on here is the number of carbon atoms. They're kinda dark green here because in biochem you're allowed to color carbon any way you want. RIBP, which is what I'm gonna call it for now by the way, has five carbon atoms, and it's going to get shoved into Rubisco and combined with carbon dioxide. One carbon. 5 plus 1 equals 6, and if you remember, our ultimate goal is to make glucose, a 6 carbon molecule. So awesome, we just smush RIBP and CO2 together and BOOM, we're done, right? Haha, <laughs> no. Can you imagine, right? Dang. If that were the case, this wouldn't even be a cycle. Also, we have to change RABP quite a bit more to get to glucose in the first place. So what really happens here, and boy howdy am I ever cutting corners on this one, is that the business end of Rubisco holds on to our 5-carbon RABP, which allows this one hydrogen to pop off. This opens the door for CO2 to slam into it and split it in half, leaving us with two copies of this 3-carbon molecule called 3-phosphoglycerate. Nice. <laughs> this is the principal miracle of the Calvin Cycle. We ripped one carbon atom out of the dang sky and made it biologically useful. These carbon atoms will eventually be turned into a crystal that holds on to the energy from sunlight. But we have a few more steps to make this viable, and we need to shove way more energy into these little phosphoglycerates, so let's keep going. The next step is reduction, where we really see the products from the last three videos. First up, two ATP molecules come in and donate one of their phosphates to each of these guys to energize them and make them just a little bit more symmetrical. Then, to really ram the energy home, the NADPH made by PS1 and Ferrodoxin two videos ago flies in, shoves an electron on, and really supercharges these bits to make glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, or G3P. G3P is this magical, incredibly energized 3-carbon sugar that gets processed into so many different things by both plants and animals. G3P is the most important thing we'll see coming out of the Calvin Cycle. But here's the thing, it actually hasn't left the Calvin Cycle yet, because if you're paying attention, you're noticing something weird. Glucose, our ultimate hexagonal goal, is a 6-carbon molecule. And these two G3Ps, they've only really taken one carbon dioxide molecule out of the air. If we just kept going making glucose right now, we would run out of our initial RIBP and the cycle would grind to a halt. So actually, most of the G3P we make during the Calvin cycle just goes back to make more RIBP. This is life, folks. Nobody said it had to be efficient or super elegant. So let's turn the wheel of the Calvin cycle two more times before we explain the last third of the process. Now we've taken three carbon dioxide molecules out of the air, and therefore one of our G3Ps can finally leave and go be useful. So with that removed, let's look at what we have left over. This leaves us with five molecules with three carbons apiece. The third and final phase of the Calvin Cycle is regeneration. The regeneration phase of the Calvin Cycle is this really complex shuffle where we recombine these five molecules into their original RIBPs. Three molecules with five carbons apiece. We have the same 15 carbons we started out with, we just need to reorganize them. This process is really tedious and complex, and will require me to dip really deep back into this nightmare textbook. And the D+, I got in my first OCHEM class. So I'm showing the pathway visually here, all the wacky combinations and recombinations, and that'll get us back to RIBP. But I'm not about to burn like 10 more minutes of your life right now, going all the way down into the depths of organic chemistry. And I mean, you know what? Comment below if you really want me to make something that insanely boring and tedious. And maybe I'll make it for my patrons on Patreon one day. But definitely not now. Please not now. The only important thing we need to note from the regeneration phase is that right at the end, we need one more ATP molecule to make each one of our three RIBPs whole again. But for now, let's close this cycle out. Ultimately, all this work has gotten us just one usable G3P. So let's rotate through three more times, fixing three more CO2 molecules, and generating one last G3P that the cycle doesn't need. Now, finally, we've trapped six usable carbon atoms. A couple more steps brings us to the enzyme aldolase, which will combine these into an almost hexagonal fructose 1,6-biphosphate. Two more reactions pop off those two phosphates, leaving us, finally, with glucose. 
Now, glucose isn't the ultimate product here, but it's the one folks recognize the most, so it's the one I'm sticking with. The thing I need you to keep in mind is, look, all that ATP and NADPH was made from the energy of captured sunlight, going all the way back to the initial moment where Photosystem II miraculously splits water after capturing individual photons. The other principal ingredient is carbon dioxide, inert carbon left over from the formation of the Earth and eons of volcanic activity. Right now, we're using the magic of organic chemistry to rearrange carbon atoms from the air enough to build a stable energy storage molecule for that sunlight. That's all that's happening. And yeah, a little water rounds out the ingredient list, but that's how you make fixed carbon and store energy if you're life on Earth. That glucose can get broken down and recombined into basically everything you see when you look at a plant, from the starch in this potato to the cellulose that makes these stems and this bark. The carbon fixed here goes on to make DNA and membranes and provide the backbone for every single compound every single living thing is made out of. That glucose is a sugar, but it can get recombined into fatty acids and proteins, meaning it's the chemical at the root of every single thing that eventually becomes food for you and you yourself. Which is what makes toughing it out through the tedious chemistry here so incredibly worth it. Because it suddenly makes you realize that it's all just sunlight, air, and water. All of this, the whole world around you, is just sunlight, air, and water. The energy in this acorn squash, which I'm about to eat and therefore sustain the chemical reactions that keep me alive and talking like this right now, it's all starch, a long-form storage unit for the glucose produced by the photosynthesis in the leaves of that plant. To go back to our match, and to paraphrase my favorite Richard Feynman quote, this is how the light gets in there. The cellulose in the wood of this match was glucose once, and so the energy being released in the form of light and heat here is literally sunlight. I'm not just burning a match, I'm very quickly reversing the photosynthetic process that made the match in the first place. And so, if this Calvin cycle is where all our fixed carbon comes from, that means the story of every single molecule that makes you up, besides the metal and minerals, started with sunlight. It's all sunlight, air, and water. That's the magic of evolution. Give our world 3.8 billion years, and sunlight, air, and water can eventually turn into the immense complexity all around you right now. Studying biochemistry this hard absolutely rules, because you'll work your way through hours of confusing, jargony chemical formulas, and suddenly a realization like this will go through you like a bolt of lightning. It's all sunlight. That's what it's all made of. If a revelation like this isn't directly the voice of God, it at least is a distant echo of it. Our world is built entirely on this chemical process because the storage of energy in the form of starch allowed our human ancestors to figure out a way to make food surpluses, which is the small edge our species used to build civilization. Everything around you is built on this, the storage of sunlight in a six-carbon hexagon called glucose. And you know, I want to take this one step further, because this isn't just the end of one video, it's the end of an entire hour-ish long series about the entirety of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the start of every food chain and every biochemical process that we take for granted today. It is our tangible connection to the universe beyond our sky. And that can be a little scary. Because we're at a point in our history where we're just discovering how empty and horrifying and hostile 99.99% of our universe is. Before photosynthesis evolved 3.8 billion years ago, life just clung to deep sea vents, sucking down sulfates and whatever. But then, our most ancient ancestors figured out how to reach back into this cold, cruel universe and take something for us. And so, if you really game that out, you realize that our Earth did not start off as this incredible and rare place we take for granted today. Your world was grown for you over the course of billions of years by a slow, methodical, and constantly iterating biochemical process. The air you breathe isn't just there, it was put there for you by other living things. Standing outside and feeling the sunshine on your face should be very deadly, but it is warm and comforting thanks to the ozone layer made for you by photosynthesis. And then they stored that solar energy, making the food chain that powers your life and the hydrocarbons that power your civilization. It's all sunlight, one way or another. 
And so, looking back at this match, it's actually deeply profound to ask how the light gets in there. And this long story of photosynthesis is the answer, and I hope it's been a satisfying one. But here's the thing. Photosynthesis is merely how energy enters our biosphere. It's just the start. The journey that energy takes as it powers you and the world around you is even more incredible. Our exploration of biochemistry is just beginning, and I'm so excited to take you all the way through it. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Once again, thank you so much for getting to the end of this video. If you like this video, the best way you can support this channel right now is by sharing it. Post it to Facebook, post it to Reddit, post it wherever it is you post things. Getting this channel out there is what's going to help make sure that it keeps growing in a way that we can keep producing these videos sustainably. I really appreciate you getting all the way to the end here, and if you want to support the channel even further, feel free to check out my Patreon, patreon.com slash clockworkshow. We are finally leaving photosynthesis and getting into some of the really wild stuff in biochem, so I'm really excited to keep going on this journey with you. At the same time, I'm ramping up to get to a much faster upload schedule, and so donating on Patreon is what really makes that happen. As always, m these videos would be no good without the consistent support I get from the community over at Biocord. If you want to be a part of the best life sciences chat room slash community on Earth, head over to discord.gg slash biology. Furthermore, the Kelvin cycle is obviously extremely complicated, and I literally made a whole bit here about glossing over a lot of the details, so feel free to head over to my Twitter, at this underscore clockwork, and see all of my sources cited, and see the discussion happening in the comments there. It's really important to me how much the scientific community keeps me honest, and I really appreciate any and all really detailed feedback I get from you all. Although at this particular time I am terrified of all the organic chemists getting ready to give feedback here. Either way, I really appreciate your time, thank you so much for getting to the end of this video, and as always, I like to leave you with peace, love, and hexose sugars. Everyone be well, thank you so much.